an analysis and discussion of the Supreme Court's latest immigration decision. My name is Joanne Lin, and I am the Executive Director of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us today. This webinar is being recorded. On March 19th, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Situ Kamu Wilkinson, an immigrant challenging the government's actions to deport him. The Supreme Court held that federal courts have the power to review certain determinations by immigration judges. The court held that federal courts do have jurisdiction to review an immigrant's cancellation of removal application based on hardship to his US citizen child, since the hardship determination involves mixed questions of law and fact. Under the Immigration and Nationality Act, exceptional and extremely unusual hardship is a legal requirement that immigrants must meet to qualify for cancellation of removal. The Wilkinson v. Garland decision resulted in a highly unusual 6-3 lineup with Justice Sonia Sotomayor authoring the opinion joined by Justices Elena Kagan, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, while Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, Jackson issued a concurring opinion. Justice Samuel Alito authored a dissent joined by Chief Justice John Roberts and Cl Justice Clarence Thomas. Now, it's not every day that an Im immigrant wins a deportation defense case before the Supreme Court. And it's not every day that the three Trump appointed justices join the three Democratic appointed justices to form a six justice majority. To unpack all that transpired in the March 19th Wilkinson decision, we have a star panel of experts on today's webinar. We will first hear from Jamie Santos, who represented Mr. Wilkinson before the Supreme Court. Jamie is a partner and chair of the appellate and Supreme Court litigation practice at the law firm Goodwin. Wilkinson was her first oral argument before the Supreme Court. Jamie is also a board member of the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Following Jamie, we will hear from Matt Adams, legal director of the Northwest Immigrants' Rights Project in Seattle. Matt is regarded as one of the leading immigrants' rights and deportation defense attorneys in the country. He has received numerous awards for his immigration appellate litigation, including honors from the Washington State Bar Association and the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Matt will discuss the potential impact of the Supreme Court's Wilkinson decision on other forms of immigration relief and on the larger immigrants' rights landscape. After we hear from Jamie and Matt, we will open up the discussion to hear from all of you. We invite all our participants to pose your questions in writing, which we will take up in the Q&A portion. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce Jamie Santos. Take it away, Jamie. Thanks, Joanne, and I'm excited to be here with you and with Matt. Um, if you see a goofy grin on my face, you'll have to excuse me because I haven't stopped smiling since last Tuesday when we got the opinion in. Uh, and I'm really excited to tell you more about my client, Mr. Wilkinson, um, how the kind of case progressed and, and what the Supreme Court held. So um, the, my client, his name is C2 Wilkinson. He came to the United States in about 20 years ago after he fled uh, Trinidad and Tobago when law enforcement officers uh, terrorized him and threatened him and his family. And he started a family in the United States. He has a child, um, a, a young boy who's a US citizen and whose mother is also a US citizen. And he worked um, as a handyman and a laborer. And he was really known in his community for being the, the, the guy who helped senior citizens take their groceries into their homes and fix things that are broken. Um, he, the, the U.S. government started removal proceedings in about 2020 and sought, um, and, and Mr. Wilkinson sought asylum and also cancellation of removal. Um, cancellation is one of the many forms of discretionary immigration relief that is available to non-citizens who the government is trying to deport. Um, and it, it applies if a non-citizen can meet four eligible, uh, eligibility requirements. So they have to have been in the United States for 10 years, they have to have good moral character, 
They have to have no disqualifying major criminal convictions, and they have to be able to show that their removal would cause exceptional and extremely unusual hardship to a U.S. family member. And in Situ's case, the government stipulated to the first three requirements. And for the fourth, the hardship requirement, um, Situ argued that he met that standard because he has a U.S. citizen son who has serious medical issues and ends up in the hospital several times a year. Um, um, that his son's mother doesn't work, she has depression, and she's unable to care for um, her son for days at a time. Uh, her uh, C2's son has behavioral issues that were exacerbated when C2 was detained. And C2 is the full sole financial support for his son uh, and his son's mother as well. Um, so before the immigration agency, the IJ, the immigration judge said that the standard wasn't satisfied, that um, that it didn't meet that requisite level of exceptional and extremely unusual hardship. And when C2 tried to appeal, the, the Third Circuit said that it had no jurisdiction to review that decision because the, uh, the inquiry was a discretionary one. And the way the kind of legal system works in this area is that the Immigration and Nationality Act, it strips federal courts of jurisdiction to review judgments regarding discretionary forms of relief but it also um, revests in federal courts jurisdiction to review constitutional claims and questions of law. And about four years ago, the court held in a case called Guerrero Las Prias versus Barr that that term questions of law that courts have jurisdiction to review, that it includes the application of a legal standard to settled or established facts. And that's what Joanne referred to as a mixed question. Um, the terms are basically synonymous. And we felt like we had a pretty good argument here because that decision was only three years old and it was joined by a current majority of the court, including Justice Gorsuch and the Chief Justice. Um, and it was really well supported by uh, canons of statutory interpretation, the statutory, statutory context and the text. Um, and plus in Guerrero La Spria, the government had argued that the, the mixed question in that case, it had to do with whether uh, a non-citizen had been uh, diligent in pursuing his claims. Um, the government had said, well, that's a super factual mixed question. So it, at the very least, shouldn't be considered a question of law. And the court rejected that position and wrote this, what seemed like a categorical holding that mixed questions just altogether are questions of law in this statutory context. And the dissent in Guerrero La Spria had also emphasized that the, cat, the, the court's ruling was very broad and categorical, uh, that the majority had held that all mixed questions, whether fact-bound or not, are questions of law. And so we, we thought under a direct application of that decision, um, we should win. And the government had offered a variety of distinctions from Guerrero La Spria. It said that Guerrero La Spria offered uh, or involved a judge-made legal standard. Um, and, and this case involves a statutory legal standard and that that's somehow different. Uh, the government argued that our issue was really fact-bound. If a, if a mixed question, it was a very facty mixed question. Um, and in fact, that it could be considered completely factual. Um, and the government also said that our issue was discretionary and so it shouldn't be viewed as a mixed question. And the court agreed with us, uh, as you mentioned, Joanne, in a 6-3 decision um, holding that it meant what it said in Guerrero La Spria, that all mixed questions, whether judge-made or statutory, whether fact-bound or not, um, are questions of law under the INA and they are reviewable by federal courts. Um, the so the majority was a, a decision by Justice Sotomayor, as you mentioned, it was joined by Justice Kagan, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Barrett, which means that we lost the chief, um, but we we won over Justice uh, Barrett, and um, and Justice Jackson wrote a concurrence um, saying that she wasn't sure that Carrera La Spria was correctly decided, but that it clearly governs this case. And then the Chief Justice wrote a dissent that was three sentences. It said essentially. I join the majority in Guerrero La Spria and I stand by the decision, but I'm going to join the dissent here because I don't think Guerrero La Spria needs to be read that broadly. And then Justice Alito um, wrote a dissent that the chief joined um, and that Justice Thomas joined. And he said in his dissent, Guerrero La Spria was wrongly decided. I dissented in that case. Um, as I said in my dissent in that case, it was written incredibly broadly to encompass all mixed questions. And I was right. Uh, and he said that the jurisdiction restoring provision under that interpretation completely swallows the 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 jurisdiction sorry the jurisdiction restoring component almost completely swallows the jurisdiction stripping component and that's not how we should read statutes. And he said, but even you know notwithstanding everything I just said about how that case was wrong, we shouldn't read Guerrero Spria that broadly. We can read it narrowly, and we should. 
And the reason he gave is he said that after Guerrero La Spria, um, Justice Breyer, who had written Guerrero La Spria, wrote another opinion in a drug labeling case. And we can read that decision in the drug labeling case to stand for the proposition that the application of law to fact that is overwhelmingly factual is actually a question of fact. Um, I will note that that is not an argument the government made, and that's not a case the government cited. Um, but the, Justice Alito said that that is how we should read that decision here. Um, so uh, excellent results. Um, Mr. Wilkinson is overjoyed. He is at home playing basketball with his son. Um, and I should just add that he had been detained for since the time that he the government started removal proceedings. The government had refused to release him even after he, there were had been criminal um, charges against him that were wrongfully uh, uh, made against him and that the, and that the state withdrew and the government still wouldn't release him. We filed a habeas petition this January and the government almost immediately released him when we did that. Um, so thankfully he is at home now, um, unfortunately that he was detained for several years in the interim. Thank you, Jamie. And yes, what joyous news that Mr. Wilkinson has now been reunited with his uh, US citizen child and the rest of his family after many years of immigration detention. Now, clearly this is a major victory for Mr. Wilkinson and his family, but the potential impact of this Supreme Court decision remains to be seen and could have um, far reaching impacts well beyond this individual case. Here to educate us on these prospects is Matt Adams, legal director of the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project in Seattle. Take it away, Matt. Thank you, good morning. And as you say, amazing results for Mr. Wilkinson but also for the immigrant community at large, I would say, given that the impact that this will have. I mean, the direct impact is making clear that individuals who are denied cancellation of removal based upon the hardship finding have access to judicial review. And you know, to many that might seem a little abstract, but for those practitioners who are defending people in deportation proceedings, you're well aware of the fact that uh, cancellation of removal for non-permanent residents is the, one, is the primary or at least one of the primary forms of relief for people who don't have legal status in this country. And I think sometimes what's most discouraging to immigration practitioners is the amount of discretion and the almost level of impunity with which immigration judges act. And especially with respect to cancellation of removal, there's a huge amount of discretion that up until now has simply been unreviewable. You have, you know, this, this law was introduced in IRA in 1996. And basically over the last almost, you know, you're going back almost 30 years now that you have only three decisions from the Board of Immigration Appeals that really discuss the standard for exceptional, extremely unusual hardship. And unfortunately, in practice, the way that plays out is that leaves the immigration judges with so much room to decide whether they're going to grant this discretionary relief based on this hardship finding. And so you have people who are regularly denied who are, who are facing you know, unconscionable hardship. And in fact, in one of the three decisions in matter of Montreal, the board said they shouldn't have to show that it's unconscionable. But unfortunately for many immigration judges, it's been that standard. You have to show that your client is the unicorn because many become callous. Given that they're deporting thousands over a year, they'll say, well, I've seen hundreds who are in this situation. And, and it could be that they've seen hundreds, but those hundreds were in fact facing exceptional, extremely unusual hardship. And yet these decisions get denied and often rubber stamped by the board and there's no room for the court of appeals to then review them. But now with this decision, advocates are gonna be able to file petitions for review and we're going to be able to start to flesh out the case law here that, that really lays a, a more concrete guidelines as to what constitutes exceptional, extremely unusual hardship. And so we're gonna and be able to overcome this paucity of, of, of legal uh, guidelines that, that hem in the immigration judge's decisions. So just for that alone, this, this is a huge decision. Um, 
because, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times over the last, you know, 30 years, I've, I've seen clients who had really strong cases and we lost on a cancellation case and we lost at the board. And unless you had a clear legal error or a clear constitutional violation, um, you know, such as being deprived the right to present testimony you know, or what have you, there was no, absolutely no window for, for judicial review. And so that, that is gone. And so that's, that is first and foremost the the primary result, but then of course it's going to have an impact on other issues as well. Uh, it's it's it necessarily falls from this court's decision that with respect to cancellation of removal for uh, victims of of violence under um, the Violence Against Women Act. So this is a subsection B two, which also has a hardship element to it that the court uh, retains jurisdiction to again apply undisputed facts to see whether they meet this hardship. In addition, uh, under that same that 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 same group for VAWA cancellation, there's there's been percolating throughout the circuits different um, results on whether the extreme cruelty is a statutory standard that the courts again have jurisdiction to review whether the immigration judge and the board got it right in, in denying a determination that, um, that the individual was not subjected to extreme cruelty. And again, I think that while, while not as clear cut, the language in this is very forceful in saying, yes, you have a statutory standard, extreme cruelty. And, and if you're applying undisputed facts to that standard, then yes, there must be um, jurisdiction for the Court of Appeals to review it because that is in fact a mixed question of law. So it's going to have an impact on other forms of cancellation of removal. And then of course, it all goes back to what, what is this all about? It's about the jurisdiction restoring clause at 1252A2D saying that despite the the statute stripping courts of jurisdiction over certain times uh, certain types of discretionary judgments and actions that if you're looking at the constitutional or legal questions then the court should be able to return uh, retain jurisdiction on a petition for review when you're looking at removal orders and so that's where it gets really interesting to see how this is going to play out with other discretionary decisions or applications for relief that have been denied, not based on a discretionary determination, but instead based upon a hardship determination or uh, based upon uh, a, you know, so for example, you the statute itself refers to the inadmissibility waivers at 1182 H and I, and both of those include um, an element requiring a hardship determination to a qualifying relative. And so again, on the one hand, it, this decision provides, you know, forceful ammunition for saying this continues to be, a, this is a question of law. It's a mixed question of law because if you're looking at undisputed facts and trying to determine whether you've demonstrated um, extreme hardship to the qualifying relative, that, falls part and parcel with this court's decision in Wilkinson. Now, it's a little bit tricky because the, the court distinguished language in those provisions that talk about the discretion or the satisfaction of the, the attorney general or the secretary making those decisions. So it's not as clear cut, but there's certainly the over arching analysis would support the, the, the finding that these are in fact questions of law and you should be able to obtain a review at a court of appeals if you have a final order and you're seeking a petition for review. When again, you're applying undisputed facts to that statutory standard. And so I guess I'd leave it at that. There, but but there's one more thing I would say is that even outside of that context, there's there's many other provisions where the statute specifies that the attorney general or the secretary has discretion to to make a decision. For example, we're working on another case that's that's right now pending um, that talks about whether a court, uh, a district court, or a court of appeals has jurisdiction to review a denied bond. Uh, 
uh, a, den a denied bond hearing where the, the court found that the individual presented a danger. And again, a danger determination, there's a long uh, case law establishing a, a very clear uh, judicial standard of what constitutes dangerousness. So again, when you have undisputed facts and you're making a danger determination, this decision provides ample uh, a basis to demonstrate to the court that that is in fact a mixed question of law and therefore a district court or the court of appeal should have jurisdiction to review the immigration court's determination in those bond hearings. Um, but it's uh, it, it's gonna be played out. We'll see how that, that um, rolls out in light of the way that the, the decision distinguished uh, 212H and 212I waivers by noting that those waivers themselves included language that talked about the attorney general's uh, discretion. And certainly the, the, the government's going to pounce on that language. So there's going to be a lot of litigation that plays out in looking at which de determinations actually are subject to judicial review. I thank you, Matt, for that um, expansive analysis of the potential repercussions of the Wilkinson Supreme Court decision in terms of affecting other forms of immigration relief. We have a great audience on the Zoom webinar today, and they include representatives from the private bar, the um, immigration bar, nonprofit community, advocates, paralegals, and lawyers. Now is your opportunity to pose any questions raised by any issues in the decision um, and in the remarks by Jamie and Matt. So please use the chat function in your Zoom webinar to pose your questions in writing and we'll be sure to um, address those. So, so as the questions are coming in, um, the first question that we've received, and I'm gonna uh, pose this to Jamie, um, you went through all the different various opinions, and there were several in this particular case, and you noted that Katanji Brown Jackson, the newest Supreme Court Justice, she joined the majority opinion in the judgment, uh, but not in the opinion, and she filed her own concurring opinion. Can you explain why? Oh, and Jamie, we, we need you to unmute yourself so we can hear the benefit of your analysis. Yes, Thanks. thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I feel like I haven't made a mute mistake in a while, so uh, sorry that it was here. Um, so, you know, what? I'll tell you kind of what she said in the opinion, and then I'll tell you why I think kind of like more normatively why she, I think, and just join the majority. Um, so what she said in the opinion is, I'm not totally sure that Congress actually wanted uh, courts to to have jurisdiction to review things when the statute has a jurisdiction stripping provision in it. And I'm not totally convinced by what I read in Guerrero Spria about why we should read the statute this way. Um, she didn't actually say I disagree with that opinion. It was more just I'm skeptical of it, um, but I'm not going to dissent on that basis. I will say why I think she did write this is that so Justice Jackson and 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 Justice Gorsuch as well. They have both written concurrences, kind of single justice concurrences, to try to really put a stake in the ground, I think both to express their judicial independence and also show that they might have kind of idiosyncratic views on particular issues. So Justice, Jas Just justice Jackson in particular is really broadly uh, deferential to government agencies. We saw that in the abortion argument yesterday um, when she was speaking about the need for courts to broadly defer to the expertise of the FDA. We saw that in the Chevron arguments a few months ago, she just really doesn't like courts second get guessing expert agencies. And she's much more likely as a result to read jurisdiction stripping provisions quite broadly. Other justices like Justice Gorsuch um, really likes judicial review. Uh, he really likes to read a jurisdiction stripping provision quite narrowly. So I think this concurrence was really part of it, uh, an indication about her broader review, uh, broader views on judicial review of agencies. Um, it's been a theme of the court this year. I don't necessarily think it reflect, reflects any particular views on the substantive standards that govern non-citizen adjudication. I think it was really more just something on the, on the kind of interplay between federal courts and federal agencies. Thank you, Jamie. Um, we have a question that's come in. This one is definitely for you, Matt. Um, 
This uh, person would like to hear more about the argument regarding federal court review of immigration judges' bond determinations. Is the argument that the Wilkinson Supreme Court decision informs how the word, quote, discretionary should be read in the section 236E of the immigration statute? Or is it an argument tied more directly to the jurisdiction restoring provision found at 1252? Again, Matt, we need you to unmute yourself Thank so we you. can Sorry. hear your brilliant answer. But, Thank you. Yes. So, um, no, it is not tied specifically to the jurisdiction restoring provision at 1252A2D, because remember, that only applies to petitions for review of final removal orders. And since the bond hearings and the jurisdiction that emerges from them is, is generally in a habeas proceeding, um, this would be distinct. I think where the language is helpful is again clarifying what constitutes a question of law versus a discretionary determination. And so what that decision reinforces is that a question of law includes a mixed question of law, even when there it is largely based upon, it is largely factual. You know, there's discussion in um, in both the, the dissent and the, the, the majority opinion as to this idea of where something is overwhelmingly factual. And the majority agrees that, yes, this is, in fact, largely a, a factual determination because there's so much um, from the facts and applying those facts to this legal standard. But regardless it's still a mixed question of law because you're focused on the legal standard. And in a bond hearing, uh, the case law from the board says the individual has the responsibility of demonstrating that they do not present a flight risk or a danger. And so that's your, that's your, your, your judicially created standard. And in fact, the danger standard goes well beyond the immigration case law and into traditional criminal uh, settings where there's a, a, a very developed um, set of jurisprudence that discusses the, the dangerousness standard. And so when you do have that clear standard, whether it's statutory or a judicially created standard, and you're applying undisputed facts, so you're taking what the immigration judge has found and saying, okay, Given that he found these facts, do they meet the danger standard or the flight risk standard? You have, under Wilkinson, a clear mixed question of law. And so that gives you room to argue that this is not a discretionary determination, because under the bond statute at 1226E, it focuses on discretionary determinations of the attorney general. And so I think we have a, a, a very strong argument that this is not a discretionary determination. Now, the attorney general can exercise their discretion in, in looking at the bond amount or things like that. But in the actual determination of flight risk or danger, I would argue that those are standards that in applying the facts, you now have a question of law that can be presented to a district court on habeas or then on appeal to a court of appeals. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, Jamie, this next question is for you. Uh, Wilkinson was your first time arguing before the Supreme Court. Um, although you have a very deep and extensive uh, background litigating immigration cases at the appellate level, was there anything unusual or surprising about your experience working on Wilkinson? I don't know that there was anything unusual or surprising. I mean, I think that the experience as a whole was was really incredible and that's what I was kind of expecting uh, that it would be but I think that to, to have you know I had the confidence of Mr. Wilkinson and our co-counsel who had been practicing immigration law for decades um, I had the support of the immigration community who offered us comments on our brief and mooted me including on Thanksgiving weekend and uh, answered all of my questions when I had this I have this crazy idea does this work and like no Jamie that doesn't work or um, I like, have the, does, can you tell me about the way these provisions interact? They're incredibly helpful. 
Um, and then the the support from my firm who gave me all of the resources that I needed and from the Supreme Court bar who provided a lot of amicus support and mooting support and moral support. Um, I think what made this case really unique and different from the way I usually practice is that I think we approach the case in a way that I really can't on most of my cases because of resource constraints, um, often budgetary constraints um, that usually you don't get to just kind of look at the case from every angle a hundred times, which is really what we did here. I mean, we, our merits briefs, we had two merits briefs. We completely wrote them, rewrote them from scratch multiple times. We got tons of input from stakeholders. And that's the kind of thing that if I could practice law like that all the time, it would be so fun, but real life gets in the way and budgets get in the way and it becomes more complicated. Um, I will say that there was this moment I had the weekend before the argument, and it was, so I argued the two days after Thanksgiving weekend, but the Saturday of Thanksgiving weekend, I had my last moot, and I was being mooted by lawyers who argued um, these three cases that had been decided by the Supreme Court, Barton versus Barr, Patel versus Garland, and DHS versus um, the Racing M, and they were these three incredibly heartbreaking losses that, in my view, I thought had really good arguments and, and could have been victories or, you know, I wish they had been victories. Um, and I and they were amazing advocates and teams. And it really both kind of terrified me and humbled me about how much was on the line and how I needed to pour all of my passion and my energy and my brain power into the case. And then after that moot, I, I rage cleaned my closet and I created a get psyched mix uh, for the week of the argument. And I got a pep talk from a good friend and really just went back in with a, a passion for the last two days of prep to do everything I could to try to get a good result for, for C2. Well, that clearly worked because you won before the Supreme Court um, with a 6-3 vote, which is incredible. I appreciate your reminding all of us, right, that these deportation defense cases are so high stakes. Um, because for those immigrants who do lose um, before the immigration court, it often means permanent separation from their family in the United States, saying goodbye to a country where some of them have lived years, if not decades, have bought homes, have created businesses, have contributed to their communities, their faith communities, their children's lives. So um, what the, what the, the decision that the immigration judge renders has far reaching and long lasting implications for not only the immigrant, but the people in that person's life. And um, I love your comment on, you know, being able to take one, a single case and look at it from 100 different angles afresh with new eyes and with an army of attorneys. I mean, Matt, isn't that what you wish you could do every single day at the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project? Um, and the next question we, we received actually is along the lines of, you know, for most people who are on today's call and for most people who work with immigrants, whether as paralegals um, or as attorneys, um, they're not able to provide the wide panoply of resources that Mr. Wilkinson received. So for the person who, let's say tomorrow, um, a consultation is set and somebody comes in and a paralegal at Northwest Immigrants Rights Project has determined that this person um, from a, 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 at least prima facie qualifies for cancellation of removal. Um, how, how should that paralegal or attorney uh, go about their assessment, their intake differently um, in light of Wilkinson? Well, what's clear now is that someone who's prima facie eligible for uh, cancellation of removal for non-permanent residents is entitled to not just appeal any denied application to the IJ and to the board, but then also seek a petition for review on that if they're found not to meet that qualifying hardship, which is primarily the reason these applications are denied. And so that's, that is the, you know, the, the, the major consideration. So oftentimes you look at someone like, well, you know, yes, they've got hardship, but nothing to really stand out there. But I mean, one of the benefits of this is that this allows you extra years in your journey. I mean, so someone might have a, you know, borderline cancellation case because they aren't able to show hardship that really sets them apart from other people who are being deported every day of the week. But at the same time, they might have 
a family visa petition that they're waiting on a priority date or a, a U visa that's hanging out there. And so this is another tool in the toolbox as far as continuing that process, hopefully keeping the person in the United States while even if they lose at the board on a petition for review, if you can obtain a stay of removal. And I know that depends upon the circuit you're in. Some circuits are much more flexible and generous with stays than others. Um, but certainly it provides you ad additional tools as you're examining, you know, what, what does the lifespan of this case look like? And I'll just add one point to that. I, I think one thing I would caution against is thinking, oh, it's fine. Federal courts can be a total backstop because if we don't win in the immigration agency, we'll just easily get removal in federal courts. I think one thing that is clear about the, the majority's decision is that they intend and expect that federal review, federal court review will still be deferential. Um, factual findings will still be completely unreviewable. So creating a really good factual record in the agency is absolutely critical. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the opinion also makes clear that credibility determinations are will be seen as findings of fact. Um, and so making that excellent state, you know, making that excellent record is really important and not, you know, necessarily relying on it. It's excellent that we can have judicial review in federal courts for lots of reasons, including those that Matt um, explained. Um, but that it, 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 they shouldn't rely on it as a backstop of, of not creating not creating a good record in the in the immigration agency, because that's most of the adjudications will probably stick with the result that happens in the agency. I'm glad you mentioned that, Jamie. And before I move to the next question, I do want to make one final call for any questions for those participants who joined us via Zoom today. Feel free to go ahead and write your question in the chat box, and we'll be sure that Matt and Jamie get to your question. So the next question we've received is actually kind of a version of the question I posed to Matt and what that you've already started to address, Jamie. Change the hypo, and let's say there's somebody who is in your offices tomorrow, um, the Board of Immigration Appeals has issued a decision um, that is adverse to the immigrants, cancellation of removal case. The immigration judge had denied uh, cancellation of removal based on determining that the immigrant had failed to establish exceptional and extremely unusual hardship to the U.S. citizen child. And that decision has now been affirmed by the Board of Immigration Appeals. The immigrant has received the decision from the board the clock is now ticking in terms of deciding what to do next uh, in terms of seeking review before federal court. What would you advise in light of Wilkinson? I, th I think anytime you've got a, a viable claim on a on a denied cancellation application at the Board of Immigration Appeals and you're uh, consulting with someone, they've got a 30 day clock. Right. And so they need to secure yeah. their right to pursue that unless they're quite certain that that they're ready to throw in the towel at this point. So they they need to, you know, um, to perfect their petition for review to file that within the 30 day window. And then if later on they want to withdraw that, they have that option, but they can't sleep on it now and then later on decide, oh, I wish I, I want to do it. Is there a way for me to, you know, get this reopened? And so the, 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 the most important takeaway for practitioners is there is, in fact, judicial review for hardship findings on cancellation applications. And if that was the basis on which the board um, upheld or denied the, upheld the IJ's decision or in the first instance denied the application, then yes, they need to counsel the, the potential client that they need to uh, file their petition for review in that 30-day window. I, I want to also add that I think that framing the petition for review will be really important because while the court did say categorically that all applications of a lot of fact are reviewable, I think that there is a very real concern that courts of appeals are going to try to kind of parse some of those things and say that if what you're really doing at bottom is challenging a factual finding, then we're going to you know, go with the substance rather than the form of your petition for review. So I think it's really important to make sure that you're framing the challenge, not to challenge a factual finding, not to challenge a credibility determination. Do that in the BIA, but once you get to the federal court, 
you know, really focus on framing the issue as a misapplication of the legal standard to the facts, you know, uh, that that the that the decision falls outside the the guardrails of what that hardship standard is meant to exemplify. Um, and that uh, and that, you know, that it was just outside the range of reasonableness. Um, so I would be very careful with framing. Yeah. And the other point that that Jamie already made, um, but that's going to be important as this starts to get flushed out is you can read in the decision a, a certain compromise, you know, on the very last or the second to last line of the decision, you had uh, Judge Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor saying, because this is a mixed question is primary factual, that review is deferential and, and just leaves it at that. But that is, in fact, what we would expect to see. And that, that in fact, abrogates some good case law out there that said there's de novo review over mixed questions of law. But now you've got this statement saying where you have this mixed question that was primary factual, the review is deferential. And, uh, you know, as a practical matter, it may not play that big of a, of a, of a role in that you always had an uphill battle in trying to convince a court of appeals that the agency missed the boat on this one, that there really is exceptional, extremely unusual hardship. So on the one hand, I don't think your your job changes that much because you still got to say, look, there, there are some clear error down here. That, but, but we have to be aware that, that on these mixed questions of law, it is going to be a deferential review, especially when we're dealing with these exceptional, extremely unusual hardship findings or extreme hardship findings in other contexts. And so we've got to be clear, at, as Jamie said, we're not challenging the facts. The judge made these factual findings, they either found the client's testimony credible or not credible. We're not challenging any of that. But what the judge relied on, on the facts that the judge relied on, are you know clearly meeting the standard. The judge disregarded these other cases or these other factors that that have to be examined. Um, thank you, Matt and Jamie, for this very rich discussion on this exciting development. I just wanted to offer either of you the opportunity for final remarks before we close out today's webinar. Uh, I will just say thank you to the uh, Washington Lawyers Committee for highlighting the case. And I mean, it was really fun to chat with Matt. Um, also, if, if you have, you know, I, I should mention that if you have, if you're working on cases that are coming up to the courts of appeals and you, you think, you know, this is a really strong case. And if I only had more resources, I might be able to to get a victory and get a get a reversal of, of the BIA. I know that those cases are few and far between. But if you have any of those cases you should reach out to um, to me, to friends that um, are at large law firms who uh, who have really great pro bono groups that love to assist in those situations. We are not immigration experts, and I, I generally don't do a ton of work in the immigration agency, in part because I don't want to screw every, anything up. And I know that all of the rules of work in the immigration agencies are so, uh, I mean, it's like you have to find a guy named Bubba on Thursday and like knock on the door at the right time. Otherwise, you've missed a filing deadline. It's just insanity. Um, but we do know federal courts really well, and we have a lot of resources for researching and writing uh, and, and love working on those types of cases. Thank you. And Matt. Nothing, nothing more to add from my end. Just, again, a big congratulations to Jamie and Mr. Wilkinson, and excited to see how this moves forward. Well, I would like to thank um, both of our speakers, Matt Adams uh, with the Northwest Immigrants Rights Project, who directs their legal program and works on immigrants' rights cases, both in Washington State across and across the country, as well as Jamie Santos, who is the co-chair of Goodwin Supreme Court and Appellate Litigation Practice, and on the side volunteers as a board member for the Washington Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Urban Affairs. Um, I will say it's welcome news to be able to celebrate an immigrants' rights victory at the Supreme Court. And so I too am joining the smiles and the, the glee on this Zoom webinar and would encourage all of you who joined us today to be sure to spread the news to your colleagues and your networks about this significant development. And with that, I thank all of you for joining us and I wish you a good afternoon. Take care.